Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Simon here. This is episode six of the Working Hours podcast. I've managed to be a bit more productive as we move further into lockdown. That's not necessarily saying much, though. It always feels I should be moving faster, but things take as long as they take. So this shows for everyone, but it's about leads. If you are leads or if you're from leads, then let's hear from you. What do you do? What have you done? What would you like to do? I want to speak to everyone. Remainers, leavers, rich, poor, environmentalists, transhumanists, SMEs, sole traders, precariat, whatever. This is not a show about how you identify, but how you relate to work, how work makes you feel, and most importantly, what you do, have done, and dream of doing. You can be anonymous or not, promote your business or just tell me your stories and share your ideas. You can reach me on Skype, which obviously is an invaluable tool for doing this during the lockdown, and still have anonymity if needed. So, as soon as you've watched and read everything in your libraries and listened to all of these episodes, then get in touch. Is your job or business going to be there after this? Has your job or business gone already? Were you, like me, looking for work when you got locked down? Are you a key worker? Do you have a dodgy employer? Are you a dodgy employer? Let me know and let your Leeds friends, everyone has at least one, know about this podcast. This is a slightly shorter episode and I'll be back at the end to try and extract some value from you. I hope you enjoy episode six. What did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, um, I don't really remember having an idea of what I wanted to be when I grow up, grew up, grow up. Have I grown up yet? That's a good question. Um, So, yeah, it was, I don't, I remember having a um, careers advisor coming into school and being highly amused by this kind of meant to be kind of complex system that they had that would ask you a few questions and get you a, an idea of what you want what they thought you should aim to be and about half the class including myself came back as being getting um the job title of a window dresser um, <laughs> which really made me laugh at the time I'm thinking i don't want to do up displays in shop windows that's not <laughs> I, I don't really know what i want to do but that isn't like a life towards well plus how many window play window dressers do people need i mean like that's an entire class surely that's the cohort for at least the region you know well, it, it was bizarre it was it was really odd i remember it. it it was like oh you know we've got all these jobs in this data bank and we'll be able to kind of like siphon it out from the way you the questions that you answer and whatever and, and it'll come up with this and ev- loads of people got window dressing i don't if we did something wrong or what, but that, that, that's, a, that's a memory that stuck with me. But um, I mean, from quite a young age, and I probably put it down to kind of my uh, stepdad's um, kind of focusing me onto IT. I enjoyed working in IT or working with IT. I mean, I'm not meaning the way of actually working, but I mean in the way of playing on the computer and doing stuff, not necessarily games, doing coding and learning about the operating system and all stuff like that has always yeah. kind of intrigued me. So from quite a young age, I kind of knew that my focus was going to be IT orientated. And you were like, you were in the 90s when there was a big growth in IT jobs and things like that. So it was fairly easy to fall into. Uh, so I, I mean, my follow on question generally is like, what, what do you do now? But you've kind of at least hinted at that. So yeah. what, what do you do now? I now work in, well, I would say IT infrastructure, but it's kind of infrastructure and application support in that way, kind of at that level. So I, my primary roles at the moment are looking after um, virtual server farms, hypervisors, and things like Office 365, the backend administration of Office 365 implementations. So currently, um, the environment I'm looking after for Office 365 has 25,000 students and two and a half thousand staff. And that's the type of kind of thing that I'm, I am have to look after on a daily basis. Okay. So what, uh, I mean, you, you used a lot of sort of working in terminology 
in there uh, that would mean something to people who know about architecture yeah. and infrastructure and so on. But what, what does that kind of involve on a day-to-day -day basis? Are you largely just sort of going in and resetting people's accounts or is it more complicated? It's than more complicated. That? There's also, I mean, there's um, been quite a lot of changes with the current um, situation with COVID-19 and people working away and needing collaboration tools and all the rest of it. So there's been a lot of kind of more configuring an environment and making it so that certain options are available to large groups of people and then controlling that environment. Mm -hmm. um, because there's there's lots of silly things that, that especially when dealing with um, the type of customer base that I have, mainly you know, the majority being students, you end up with silly things where they will start creating stuff that could be visible by a lot of people, but they'll name it something that would be offensive to certain people. So it's controlling this sort of kind of environment where you, you're not only, you're trying to make everything accessible, but you're also trying to restrict it to make it so that you don't end up suddenly somebody kicking off and going and complaining to people and it ending up where people make rash decisions to close off services, which then affect a hell of a lot more people. So you, there's a lot of kind of, manipulation of a, of a of a kind of digital environment that you end up doing but having to have quite a sensible view set on to make it so that it's most accessible but also restricted and controlled to make sure that it complies with all kind of regulation and is mm -hmm. and is and is and is actually working for everyone because you know we had a, a great example of someone doing a student doing something that was blatantly done just to see if they could was they created a group that was called HR and they managed to do it. And then everyone was sending sensitive documents to the HR, to oh, our right. HR, but was yeah, managing yeah. to hit this group, which was set up, which meant it could receive emails. So this, yeah. this group got shut down really quickly. But I mean, it's just a case of, you're dealing with 18 to 25 year olds who yeah. will push the boundaries. And, and, and to be fair, Something like that, from our point of view in, our, in my line of work, is a case of, yeah, you, you, you learn from this sort of thing and go, right, we yeah. need to start being restrictive because this, can, this could be someone, you know, a, a student or a member of staff sending something in that was highly sensitive that mm -hmm. should only be seen by a certain person who may have been waiting for it to arrive and move it into a secure yeah, yeah. or whatever. And, it and the whole data protection. Yeah, with somebody who you don't even know who they are or what, what they've done with it and if it's been distributed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I mean, there's, a lot, there's a lot of that. That's kind of like a white hat hacker though in some way. I mean, more so if they told you that they'd done it or, you know, like I was able to set this up rather than you finding out. But it is kind of those, like you say, those things sort of highlight things that you've overlooked sometimes, you know, okay. like... Absolutely, yeah. and that there's you, yeah, you when you when you're putting in something like you know when when you're making a big change, so moving to moving all, all our systems out to um, in this case it was Microsoft, it opens up so much possibilities for people, but also opens up so many vulnerabilities for people. <laughs> And, uh, and you know, they're all they all Microsoft are doing is saying, here's a platform, you can do loads of stuff with it. It's brilliant. Look at us. We're great. And then afterwards, you kind of go, wow, this is a huge amount of stuff to suddenly realize you've got to manage. Yeah. And without actually understanding exactly how to manage it, it can be an absolute nightmare. Yeah. Uh, from a, from a, Especially from an for that user many users as well. Yeah, from an end user point of view, it's a, in an environment like ours, it's a, it's a minefield because, you know, it all, it's all very personality driven as well. There'll be, there'll be people out there who are very closed off and don't want to have all their stuff in a shared environment that can be viewed by everyone and other people who just don't care. And, yeah. and, you, and they're all in working in groups. You know, you can have a, a class of a lot of people who get split into groups and in that one little group, you could end up with people who... Uh, uh, completely opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to stuff like that and then you're shoving all that stuff onto an online um, service so yeah you've got to always respect kind of privacy and um, viewability for what 
people are working on and all the rest of it. So there's a lot of a lot of that. That's probably more of my job than anything of the um, the general day to day kind of ticking over type stuff, which they come in, but we always try and get all that filtered out by um, uh, like you know the standard help desk. So essentially, I'm third line. So you've got first line being the person who picks up the phone when a user rings up and says, "I've my Turn it on and off again. Yeah, exactly. Second line are normally the people who would go out and actually um, fix a, a someone's computer on, like a, a staff member's machine on site, or go and help out when they're doing, uh, I don't know, something like clearing or something like that in, in the uni. And third line, we're all looking after more the back end, the stuff that nobody really sees but just expects to work. Yeah. Yeah, the the main bit, the main infrastructure bit. Yeah, so we're, we're, it's a very um, it, it's a it's a kind of it's a job where you do it and you very rarely get thanked because if anything goes wrong, you're to blame. And if yeah. it's working, well, it should be working. So no one's going to thank you for it. It's exactly the same as any utility company, really. You have the water board or something. Nobody ever like sends them a letter saying. You know what? This last week, every time I turned my tap on, it was ace water came out. Yeah, if it you know doesn't, what? you'll be on them in a second, going, "You're rubbish, you." <laughs> <laughs> I turned the tap on today, and water came out. It's amazing. How do you manage it? <laughs> um, so you obviously didn't walk straight into that. Uh, no. I mean, that's obviously a, a pretty reasonable level in terms of. IT ability, knowledge, experience, and so on. So, how did you get into that? Did you did I, you do a course for it, or did you like you just fell into it through gathering experience? Or I went to college after school. End of school, I was a bit fed up with education. Didn't want to go to university. Didn't want to go to sixth form, and uh, realised that I needed to do something extra some more vocational qualifications of some description to get into a job so i went and did a btech at college and um, part of that btech was six weeks work experience somewhere and um, i mean the btech course was all right it was it was nothing special i wouldn't you know i mean it's, it's completely dated now what i did and i'm not sure what level they do now in a, in a college environment but um, at the time, I wouldn't have recommended other people do it. I didn't think it was that good a course. But they they had a the, the, the college itself sorted out your work placement. They basically came up with a load of places and kind of went, right, you're going here, you're going there. And about four of us didn't get given a place. And when they looked through the records, they'd managed to um, miss us off the actual list. So they'd allocated all the jobs that they had and then didn't have any. So in about, we got told this about, two weeks before our work placement was um, about to happen. Mm -hmm. and um, So they were going to look in for us. And uh, someone had suggested to me, why don't you just walk up the road to the university and have a word with them? Because they probably got one of the largest computer departments um, in, in, in Leeds for, for, yeah. you know, as a massive business in its own right. And, uh, and then they're really likely to take on student placements. So I went up there and they said, yeah. And so I started, I got, I did, I did, a, did a six week work placement and five weeks into it, the person in the area I was working in offered me a job. So I finished, nice. my, course at, uh, finished my course at the college. And then um, uh, not long after that, that guy came down and handed me a brown envelope and said, fill it in at your own, own pace, but don't worry, the job's yours. And so was that based on just you working there or was it like it wasn't conditional on you had to pass the course that you were on or anything like that they just saw you and thought this yeah. guy knows what he's doing and has the ability to learn yeah I don't think they were bothered about the course to be honest and in fact I remember I remember having a chat with both the person who was my boss when I was there and his boss and saying that I felt that I'd learned more in the like four to five weeks I'd been there than I yeah. had on the year and a half at college. But yeah. I'm very much somebody who will learn more from having hands-on than, than being uh, somebody who gets given a book and says, learn that. 
Um, if I read a book cover to cover on on a on something IT or technical related, I'll still come out of it and go, I'm still not sure. Yeah, you can give me a, you can give me a, a system, and within a couple of days, I'll probably be like, all right, I know how to do that. And if I don't know yeah. how to do it, I know how to search for the right the right way to find the answer out probably within about 30 seconds you know so yes it's, it's that sort of understanding and uh, and yes i think it was more the fact that i was not only capable and i knew a lot about it at that point as well i was so i was young and eager yeah. <laughs> and you know that that made a big difference and uh, it was it was an you know it was an exciting field as well i mean it's still kind of an exciting field but it's it, there's much more variety of people in there like it was much more exclusive before because it seemed a lot more te technical you know there weren't the flashy graphics and flash animations in your websites that made it seem like and the user interfaces weren't the same like you had to know more code and I mean that's yeah. the impression that I had at the time well it's I mean it's depends. I mean I never I've never been a coder and um, I'm still no good at coding really but since when did I start working there? Was it ninety four? It was either ninety four or ninety five. I think it may have. Well, no, I think it was ninety five, ninety six, actually. But anyway, so that was a tough time. And at the time, IT was, I think, quite simple in its own right. You essentially had you had kind of your your programmers, you had your web developers, and you had your people who worked with with computer kit. And that was kind of, it was really kind of like, it, it seemed very, very narrow and quite, and there was people developing stuff and in like, you know, when you, when you end up chatting with, when I first started then, I ended up chatting with people in the school of computing, you could see the enthusiasm and the fact that they were able to like do push boundaries. And I remember getting people from the school of computing coming down to speak to our IT department and then turning them straight to me to speak to me because I was like reading all the computer magazines and completely up on what technology was about to come out and they were wanting to push the boundaries all the time. So they the, the bosses and stuff would be a bit like, well, we speak to our supplier and our supplier tells us what they've got. Mm. They're not really talking about something that's six months down the line. They're, yeah. they're, they're wanting to sell you goods. They're not wanting to kind of go, oh, well, don't buy anything now because six months down the line, you can buy this. They want the money out of your, your hands straight away, don't they? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'd be looking at all this stuff. So I'd be talking to people and kind of saying, oh, you know, you, you, you know this is coming. And they'd be like, yeah, and bounce ideas and stuff. And it was, it was exciting. It was good. It was really kind of like, it made you enthusiastic to go into work. Yeah. Um, but um, in those years, um, in, in all those years kind of gone now, the whole of um, IT has become a thing now where basically business doesn't work without it. And it's yeah. grown so much that there isn't a small team looking after this section. There's like many small teams looking after many, many sections because it's all so much more kind of complicated and there's so much more to it, which makes it in a way that you can end up being quite, you kind of due to the job you blinkered, mm -hmm. so you end up where you you kind of want to know more, but you end up focused on one thing and you don't see the bigger picture, which it it didn't used to be as much as that because you'd have a, a wider scope of things that you'd end up looking after. So you you sort of had more oversight. You know, like I suppose at the moment we're we're really talking in a kind of I mean the internet was there, but it wasn't. You know this is pre free serve in the UK and so on so it wasn't I mean, yeah. it didn't really get massive till like the latter half of the 90s over here did it um, no exactly and I mean it and was, even up to just the millennium you know there was still most young people were online but there was still the vast majority of other people weren't no, exactly so yeah but anyway so so I kind of digressed there. but so that was where I kind of got into working in IT so I went to college did work placement impressed them got offered a job started working at, at Leeds Uni and I bounced up through Leeds Uni so I started working in their hardware deployment section which was very much dealing with new kit coming in processing it in the way of you know just getting it onto an asset register dealing with faults on people's hardware and um, faults on students computers stuff like that 
And then after two years, I think, there, moved into their second line team. And the second line team went through about three different changes of name and bosses and restructuring within the department. I think it started off being an IT facilities management and ended up being just an IT second line. I think I can't remember what my title was by the time I left. As much as I can see now the scope of having a having the experience of working in a first line environment could be useful for someone like me who's worked in IT for so long. Mm. But working in second line was just great. It was basically a people job. If you're good with people, you could do that job as long as you knew your IT stuff. You didn't need to know that much because you had such a big team of people around you that even if you went to a situation where you didn't know what the, the solution was, you could find it by just speaking to other colleagues. But yeah. uh, the actual job itself, um, I, uh, I got bored of by the end, but for many years I loved, and I loved it just because of the, the variation of people and departments that I'd go to. It was very, very interesting. And I found, I mean, I've always worked in universities and the, the kind of massive amount of different people you meet is really interesting. And in that second line role, it was unbelievably interesting because in like, I was covering and supporting certain areas and things like school and medicine, you'd meet some of the most like, you, you'd go in there to do a job that would be five minutes and two hours later you'd come out and you would have to make an excuse to your bosses why the job took so long, even though it was a really simple one. But you'd, I remember going and seeing people who were um, designing on uh, on like old school 3D rendering machines, um, uh, knee and hip joints, but literally yeah. doing them from an X-ray and like loads of X-rays and then building up this this 3D design to be able to then send it off to get things like that developed. And you're just like, wow, this is life-changing stuff for people. And then you do that, and then you go and work in, uh, in something like theology. And, and you, know, you just bounce between all these variations of different viewpoints and all sorts. You go and work in the languages department and so many different types of people. And it was, uh, that was what I loved about that job. The IT bit it kind of was easy in a way because you know yeah. I could do that, and it was it was it was simple to me. It was simple, but the the people made it the enjoyable part of going to work. Yeah, and I suppose with a role like that as well, you know, where you're being sort of more hands on, you are learning a lot because you're encountering a lot of different problems, errors, so on. So mm -hmm. you know, you'll get one that you'll spend a couple of hours on, and then you might see that again then it's like I know how to do this now so it takes me five minutes yeah exactly exactly so what was what was like in terms of staff levels and so on I mean did you start with quite a small team and end with quite a big team that's the impression that I would get or did it stay about the same or it grew a bit but it didn't grow massively um, the, the workload was generally quite manageable there it was, it was quite a, a, a manageable kind of like, can't remember how many more people we got. I'm trying to remember how big the team was now and I'm literally doing it. I can't remember all the people, but I can visualize the shape of the office and where the desks were. So I'm kind of thinking mm. so it was four and eight. But you didn't start off with like three people in one no, small room and no, end up with start, 20 people on one floor. Probably about eight to 10 people. And actually the team probably was closer to about 16 to 18 people. So the team did grow quite a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really thought of that, but yeah. So I did that. And um, then the last part, the latter part of work was, it was getting annoying and tedious. I was having um, a lot of conflict with my boss at the time, um, which in hindsight was probably more down to um, tiredness and hangovers due to my <laughs> lifestyle at that point in my life. Um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, it was, it, it just got to the point where it became a bit tedious and it was like going in and thinking, oh, I'm doing the same thing day in, day out. 
and a lot of the, the management had changed and the way the projects are being run had changed and there was there was a different vibe in the team by the time I got to the point where I was like, I have to leave here. And I've been working at Leeds 12 years at that point. And so then, did it feel like there was no way for you to progress? Did you feel like you'd hit your limit there? Like you, at, there wasn't somewhere that, to go into? At that point, I'd have loved to have changed my job and stayed at Leeds. Because commuting to Leeds is easy. The people I worked with were great. You know, I've still got really good friends who are at Leeds Uni and still working there. I'm not sure how they managed to still work there, but, you know, they put up with it and stayed there. But then this, this, I've, I've made some brilliant friends when I was working there. And then, But I remember my boss turning around to me and saying, if you want, the only way up is out. And I was kind of like, that's completely against what the actual recruitment pack even says that you get when you start. And we were still giving out. And it was like, oh, you know, we offer all these opportunities for progression. And then you've got a line manager saying, if you want up, it's out. Mm. And I was just like, right, okay. And then an opportunity came up. But, and I was thinking, well, it's a, it's a bit of a pain in the ass to commute, but it's a proper grade up. And the way pay scale systems work in universities is essentially you start at the bottom and every year you take an increment up until you get to the top. And a pay scale, depending on which one you're on, could be anywhere probably from about five grand from start to finish up to about 30 grand from start to finish. Of The, the further you go up, the, the bigger um, the changes are. So the, 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 the pay scale, the pay rise was worth it. The change was so worth it. The team was, was a really good team um, who I moved into over there. And that went along for a bit, and then they uh, dissolved the team, which mm. was quite disappointing at the time, but kind of beneficial for me. So I went over there doing a job that was classed as a client consultant, and the whole premise of that job title and job role was to ensure that the departments in were falling in line with central IT's IT focus and falling in line with their, their own budget so that mm. they had a if they had a i don't know i mean i was one of my main areas i was in was art and design mm. so they had some like you know some stuff that they wanted to do that was going to cost a lot of money and essentially wanted max or wanted whatever and they wanted to do it this way and um, mm. when you've got an it service is basically essentially across the board microsoft based Mm. When they introduce a load of Apple kit into it, it's whether or not you can do that and keep it secure with the users having access to their storage mm. space and still being able to get uh, to all the lecture notes and blah de blah. And at the time, it wasn't as um, it wasn't it wasn't online in the way that it is now, where you can just dump everything into one drive and it'd be there. And that's what it should have been. And that was really interesting. And it was it was really nice to get a good friendship with like the deans in departments and the head of International Study Centre at the time. She became a great friend. And uh, and it was it was interesting. It was varied and it was able to kind of like basically be an advisor and make sure the communication between our department and these other departments was really kind of open and fluid and made it so that they couldn't they could come forward with a suggestion. And you would have to be able to say no to them, but in a way that is basically saying, we can't do it like that, but we can do it like this. We can yeah. still offer you your exact solution, but it might not be in the way that you originally done it. And essentially make it so that they thought they're happy with that solution at the end of it all. So it's kind of a, a, a job related with dealing with people and mm. understanding IT but also being able to have that kind of uh, communication from both sides, to so being able to work within our own department and talk technical, to being able to turn that into a non-technical speak, to be able to speak to them and make sure that this worked throughout and ensure that everyone ended up with something that worked for whatever they were trying to do. Mm -hmm. And they dissolved that because they didn't believe it was needed. They've kind of reinstated it now, which... I'm not surprised at because it was blatantly needed and anything like a university or any massive corporate type of thing with so many variations needs to be able to ensure that there is a level of communication between 
one group of people and another group of people mm. if they all rely on each other but they mm. don't understand how much they rely on each other yeah it's kind of basically where it comes from and uh, but at, when they dissolved it there were jobs um within the university within it and i wanted to kind of get into infrastructure which is exactly where this kind of where we, we got onto this from and so that's mm. how i got into that and I walked into it without any knowledge of working on file servers or anything like that before. And it was quite a scary prospect to come into that because you see them as being kind of massive machines that are, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, bit, it's, a, it's a computer in a rack and that's all it is. But you walk in there thinking, oh, it's going to be so complex and it's going to have so much like, all this stuff can go wrong and one wrong click and it's going to cause like massive outages across the university. But once you kind of got your head around it, it was actually quite straightforward. And it was just the same as doing anything else in IT. It's just a different bit of software. And the, the fact that the machines are so much more powerful is because they're dealing with more people connecting to them. That's all it is, or more storage or whatever. But I, when I got in there, I started working with a, a guy who was still, he sits opposite me now at work. And then he kind of took me under his wing and kind of went, look, I know it's a bit daunting, but we've got this big new project. It's all email based. We're going to be moving from one, ser one uh, older service to a newer service. Let's just do this. Let's, let's, let's work together. And I understand all the email side. I can teach you that. You already know Windows. Don't be afraid of it. We can run with this. And, uh, and it was great. And we had really good banter. So it was a great introduction having getting into that finding it a little bit daunting, but having somebody who essentially uh, kind of carried me through the first bit to make sure that I understood, and if I wasn't understanding, would say, don't bring it up in a meeting. There's no need to kind of like start trying to simplify stuff. I'll go through stuff afterwards with you if you're not understanding what they're talking about. Because it was a bit like rabbit in your head, like rabbit in the headlights when, you, when I walked into that role. But yeah, so that was, that was all good. Um, I was going to say that uh, like, I mean, the way that you've retold the story, none of it particularly seems like it's been a massive learning curve for you, apart from there, potentially. But were there, were there any way, like, what would you say is the most difficult thing you've had to kind of get your head around career-wise? Um, that was. That, yeah. moved from, that moved from second line to, um, to, um, to third line was the, the steepest learning curve I've had to do. Because everything else before that was essentially all desktop computers, operating systems, and I've been on top of that since I started getting into IT. Mm -hmm. And actually understanding an operating system and kind of, uh, you know, understanding, understanding the, uh, that, has given me as much enjoyment as playing computer games. <laughs> I'm that sort of geek. <laughs> but that's that's just who I am. And I mean, the thing was, it's like, it's actually, you know, the fact that I've enjoyed it has made a lot of my working life really easy. Because mm. it's meant that, you know, it's like, I can do that. It's just second nature to me. I can pretty, you know, it doesn't really, yeah, things will baffle me and there's always something that catches you out and you're like, what? Why is it doing that? But you get your head around it and then figure out what it is. But moving into that third line, it's kind of changing your outlook of how things is. There's so much more, so much more complexity to it because it's, um, instead of it being, a person at a computer doing a thing, you're looking at a server doing a thing for, in our case, colour 30 to 35,000 people. And it's and it, it's massive amounts of, of data, of complication, of security. There's so many more layers that you will suddenly go, this is actually huge. And yeah, you can you can set something wrong and affect an entire affect an entire um, group of people, which isn't just a handful. It's not like saying, "Oh, yeah, that room through there got affected." It's like, "Oh yeah, I once tried to do something with our email service. 
it didn't work, so I just moved it back onto the old onto the old bit, thinking nothing of it. Didn't realise that to do that, it automatically rebooted every bit of, our, of email equipment. It just <laughs> rebooted them all, mm. and that literally took our email service out for 15 minutes. Now it's only 15 minutes, but mm. when you've got all your staff in the middle of the day relying on email, and every single email client, like your Outlook on your screen. Uh, several up. hours of phone calls and emails. Oh, I, I, I had to read IT support and it was like everything, you know, that sort of thing is like where you, before you do something wrong on a, on a in second line and it's just a case of you, you do something wrong and it affects that user and it might make it so they're not working as fast as yeah. they would have been if I hadn't made a mistake. But now I make a mistake and I take out everyone right from the vice chancellor right down to the um you know the the, the people who were, it was i didn't even affect any students because they'd only moved it was literally just staff i just pissed off all the staff um, but i mean that that was that sort of thing in its own right is a is a massive learning curve you suddenly realize that you can't ever rely on that you that your you can't ever assume that what you're about to do is going to happen. Nearly everything needs a, a, a research kind yeah. of like, you need to look into each step because yeah. I had no idea that was going to happen and that was disastrous. It wasn't disastrous. No one lost any data. No emails weren't sent. They just were queued. But it was still massive amounts of support calls, me getting pulled up by every person of management in our department saying, why did you do it? And me kind of going, uh, I thought it wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's, it's it has that's been it's been a steep learning curve, and it's been a lot of stuff realizing how much more, how much one one small change can make such a big difference. It's well for what you've said. I want to just cover a little bit about the people side of things. So obviously, it's like the second line stuff. You're going out and seeing people. You said that that was really. I think that's a good experience and a good part of the job. Um, from this side of things, where you're more staff based, and I'm imagining you're going to be in more meetings, and I imagine you're involved in more departmental meetings or questions from departments. So, is that like how's that changed? Obviously, like what I'm leaning towards is that I think the moving into uh, third line support dealing more with the institution you're dealing more with the heads of department and so on with their plans and with their strategies um, not that you'd necessarily be involved you'd only be involved if they had some sort of technical question but that gives you more knowledge about the organization itself and how it runs and what what they're paying attention to whereas in your a, a lower level and on second second line support you're seeing it more from like the student side of things, the customer user side of things. Um, does that ring true? And does that like, can you talk about the differences in that, like the two effects? Unfortunately, it's not, it's not as varied as that. So mm. the, the feedback and the drive that comes from what departments are wanting now um, comes to me second hand through previous meetings that have happened so my meetings that i have are normally with the same people and i'm dealing with the same groups within our own department um, right. and it is a bit draining um the, there's i've often felt since being in this this role that you have days where you're like i wish i was back in going out around the department around the university and seeing people because of that yeah. variation, rather than being in meetings, especially when you've got, you know, I mean, you're always in a situation, it's never, a, I like the team I work in, they're a good bunch, but in certain situations, people drive you mad, I'm sure I drive people mad, but other mm. people drive me mad, and when you're in the same group, day in, day out, mm. you end up where you know there's a meeting about to happen, and you already preempt who's going to absolutely piss you off. And it's like you're like oh god this is going to be hard work i mean <laughs> it's, it, but and so the, yeah so that that variation doesn't happen anymore yeah it's a lot more meeting driven it's a lot less people driven 
my previous experience definitely benefits um de definitely benefits me in the decision making that we make on how we do changes and how we do things and often mm -hmm. i'm asked about uh, i'm asked viewpoints of stuff because there's quite a few people who pretty much kind of got degrees then taken a focus on a on a microsoft course and pretty much only ever worked on third line or something like that level and have never yeah. experienced the from a customer's point of view more yeah user frustration and, and like you, that. you sometimes get in meetings decision decisions being made then you just think that's such an it view that's such mm. a Oh, we do this and just and that's it. And they're like, oh, that's going to affect that many people. Oh, well, they'll have to deal with that. And it's like, if we were a, if it wasn't a no, university, your team will have to deal with that. Yeah, if it wasn't a university and what you were talking about was a product that you were selling to people, and your attitude was you'd have to deal with that, you'd just lose customers that move to a product that would be better suited and doesn't have the well, you've got to deal with that attitude. You know, you've got you've got to have the customer's viewpoint in mind at all point, or for all changes, pretty much. And sometimes the answer is they've got to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of big products do it all the time. Microsoft do it with their operating system <laughs> every every damn five years or something. You know, but you've think, moved all the buttons around again. You have to guess where they are. Exactly. This time we've made it so that you have to use your nose to operate this machine. Great, thanks. Um, I don't like it because they've got rid of the actual buttons. I don't like these app things or where they've, you know, because they've might try to make it integrated with touch screens and stuff. So yeah. they've got rid of the actual buttons on like the office suite. And it's like, I don't like it. I want buttons. I like having buttons to click. <laughs> no, exactly. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's quite. It's, it's definitely lost a lot of that kind of uh, interpersonal kind of the ability to be able to go out and meet people is something that's definitely lacking in that role. But it's it's a thing I knew I was gonna I was gonna change. I didn't go into that position and, and think, oh, I'm still gonna be able to do that. I knew full well that I was going to lose that. So that was that was a personal choice, and it's been interesting. And as I say, the team I work in are, are generally. A really good bunch, and I'm about to leave and move to another university, and that's that's going to have a whole new load of people who I'm sure will be a decent bunch as well. And it's you know I'm I'm looking forward to that. In fact, I'm looking forward to the the change and the people aspect probably more than anything else because the the job's going to be really similar to what I've been doing, and I can do my job, but having a nice new bunch of people and a, and some kind of like some variation and they'll be doing stuff differently that will uh, I think probably give me a kick in the ass that I need at the moment anyway because you end up getting quite lethargic because I've ended up being for yet again another 12 years well maybe you're a 12 year guy you know you do 12 years, here, 12 years there <laughs> and then you know you do like four lots of that and then you're out i'm done well, so uh, uh we haven't we haven't touched on the the big the big elephant in the in the room in the zoom chat room so uh you mentioned covid earlier so we're still in covid time so it has this been affecting you work-wise work-wise it's been the best thing that could ever have happened to me <laughs> because one of the the, the, the things that's been really hard over the past, and where are we now, 2020, over the last five years, so five years ago, my marriage broke down, and then I now have the kids 45% of the time, ish, something like that. And so my commute and my flexibility at work, which to give kudos to um, my work, they were absolutely great and gave me the flexibility I needed to be able to see the kids. The problem that didn't give me any flexibility was the trains, and they just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And public transport has been a massive letdown for me. And that's um, that's been that was my primary reason when I first started looking for a job closer to home was because of the, the commute. And my commute at the moment 
takes about 30 seconds for me to stumble down a flight of stairs in my pants <laughs> and sit on the computer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can't grumble about that. Um, so, and everything can be done from every Every from single home, bit aspect of my job can be done remotely. It was, I had an interesting conversation with the head of department who, when he found out I was handling my noticing, which was obviously the day I had my noticing, um, he contacted me straight away and, uh, and tried to get me to stay. And he said, oh, you know, is there anything we can do to be more flexible? I can offer you one day a week working from home. Yeah. And my view on that was you were already ready. You were already just about to offer everyone in the department one day a week working from home if it suits them and they need it mm -hmm. and i was thinking offer me something better if you want me to stay can you yeah. offer me five days a week working from home and i only need to come into the office when i actually need to be in the office mm -hmm. but that wasn't on the table and it's all down to the way that they've done the they want to try and appease everyone and not upset anyone mm -hmm. and what actually would be far better to do is to take a case on case basis and work on the fact of why does this person want to work from home can we allow him to work from home do we get better work from him working from home all these kind of things can be evaluated and then um, and they already know from since covid hit that actually i work far better working from home mm. I, I get in, I, I can start the morning and be quite happy yeah, before I could start in the morning and be quite happy and then deal with Transpanine Express. And by the time I get to work, be an absolutely miserable git. You know, <laughs> it's, and it, it's that. So, you know, the, the whole the idea that it's ended up when I'm working from home is has been fantastic. Um, the lockdown in other ways has affected me in the way of the socialising, seeing friends, seeing family. That's upsetting and and kind of yeah it, it hasn't been to the point where i've kind of been uh you know it's just it, it's more of a niggle you're kind of like oh i'd love to go to the pub tonight yeah that sort of attitude just love to go to the pub tonight or i'd love to go around to a mate's house this evening go and have yeah. a with a few friends and go and see see it see a bunch of mates that sort of thing is is the thing where you just kind of like balls and you think oh you can have a zoom chat and we've had a good laugh and a few zoom chats and stuff like that but it's not the same not as just, same. It's just, it's just chilling on a sofa or being sat in a pub and just with, even with just a mate and having a pint. It's like, if, even being at home, pouring yourself a pint of beer, yeah. it's, it's not the same as having a pint in the pub. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that point of view, it's affected me. But from a work point of view, um, it's, it, it's been nothing but a blessing. Because mm. I can do... I can do my hours. I see my kids more, um, and and I have absolutely no issue working from home whatsoever. It's been great. Uh, what about on the collegiate level? Is it like is everyone able to keep in touch and sort of? I I guess you're all on chats all day long, anyway. Either way. Well, um, I mean, we yeah, we've um, we have video calls and we have. Um, meetings and stuff. I mean, one of the things that I've found been, I mean, a couple of people have uh, messaged independently about this um, out of the broad scope of the meetings, but meetings are more efficient. Before when we've had, we've, we've had meetings, generally a meeting that would be like a big group of us in an office um, would take, let's say it took an hour. We're finding that they're taking between 20 minutes and half an hour. And it's because they don't go off on a tangent because everyone's muted and then you unmute talk and you don't end up with that banter. So you kind of lose the banter side of it, but it wasn't beneficial anyway, really. And mm. you still get the banter because you end up during the working day chatting with colleagues anyway. And half the time, it's instead of typing, it's easier just to kind of go free for a call and just go, yeah. And in that period, you might have, you know, five, ten minutes talking about what you need to speak to them about, and then five, ten minutes just going off on a random tangent about some of yeah. the nonsense. But so yeah. you're still getting it, but you're able to be more cherry picking about who you have your, your conversations with. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you can't mute someone who's stood by your desk, unfortunately. No. 
<laughs> no, well, I had a, it was a meeting going on the other day and there was a certain person in there who was saying something that um, was essentially just rubbish and, and it wasn't making sense and it, it wasn't constructive and it wasn't anything relative or useful for where we were actually going. It was literally just saying, saying words that were just wasting <laughs> time. <laughs> and I was WhatsApping another colleague, kind of going, I'm so pleased I can mute the, the microphones muted in the moment because if they could hear what was coming out of my mouth, I would be like having a P45 tied to a brick and thrown on my head. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way forward for me in street and more like other media engagements. And then all, all the business can be done in the meeting. I, I mean, I, like, I can imagine that as well. I, I, I can imagine with uh, uh, a work-based meeting or on a chat, you know, like a video chat platform, that you don't get, you don't get the atmosphere, you know, you don't get the tension in the room or the boredom in the room or frustration as much. It's just people go on and they say what they need to say when when they get a moment to say it. Because there's a weird sort of, you don't get the same signals to speak. And, and, you know, when someone else is going to speak um, is on video phone as you do in real life, like, you know, I've found a lot when, when I'm chatting on video that you, you know, you, uh, you fill it, you try to fill in dead air or you speak over each other more. And because you're speaking over each other on a video chat, neither of you can actually hear what you're saying. Like normally when you overlap dialogue in real life, you both hear what the other person said. Yeah. So uh, there was a question there, but then I got lost in it. <laughs> well, no, the way you, what you were saying essentially is, 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 is bang on the mark. It's, it's the um, it, it's beneficial. In a, I mean, it's, it's it's there's pros and cons because you've got the you've got the ability to be able to make it so that you can you can lose some of the tension. You don't you don't get some of the snipiness and things like that. In the meetings we've had, we haven't had any any situation where there's been digs at people. Yet in our meetings, quite often, there's, yeah. there's certain tensions that run high between certain individuals, and yeah. especially when there's a cross on a certain subject, you end up with sniping, and it's and it's just a bit like there's no need, you know. You don't get that with video chat, but you do also lose a sense of that. Well, basically, what we were just kind of saying about the fact that you. It's that case, the kind of the friendliness and the bonding that you can actually get from a face-on-face -face meeting mm. is can be really good, and you don't get that in a video chat either. And the whole technology in its own right is trying to do stuff like if one person is talking and another person starts talking, it will either try and cancel out the one who's talking over the other or cancel them out and let the other person talk. So you don't get that, as you were saying, you don't get that like fluid ability to have more than one person talking at once, which you know, the human brain's able to actually take in. You, you, you might not get everything that everyone said, but you can take in stuff and you can, and you can still, it, it makes for a discussion stroke argument in certain times and they can, they can be really constructive in their own right. And so, mm -hmm. Video chat in its own, in the way it's it works, makes it so that that can fail. Mm. If there's somebody who dominates and will try and talk over you, you will lose out. The, mm. the whole technology will cause you to lose out, and you'll end up backing down. So you, you, that's it. Then you end up where there'll be a conversation that happens, and then it's followed up by a group email going. Following that last group thing, this is where we should not agree with it. And so, you know, yeah, it's it's the, there's pros and cons. But for doing my day to day job, working from home is fine. Most meetings fine and have been actually really good. But I'm not saying that it's the be all and end all and the right way to deal with all meetings. I think mm. I think there's 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 definite there's definite positives to being with people for many, many reasons, but in, just in, in a work-related environment, I think that for a good discussion to take place and a lot of construction, kind of constructive stuff to come out of it, you probably get 
better feedback and everything out of it by being in the same room and having it than you would over a, um, a video chat. So, that's episode six. Like this, share it, and do some online labour for me. More importantly, tell your in real life colleagues and neighbours about this. Tell every loiner you know about this. More so than that, get in touch. This is only going to work if I can continue to get guests. You can DM me on Twitter at Western Studios 2, Instagram me, Western underscore Studios underscore Leads, or I have a secure email, Western Studios at protonmail.com, or just Skype me at Working Hours Podcast. We all tell ourselves stories about ourselves. Why shouldn't Leeds tell its story? Your stories declare interdependency leads because behind every great name is a great network of people. So let's hear from you about you. Take care, best of luck, work together, and let's do something different on the other side of this current crisis.